When I was in college, I went to a Bible study at Grace United Methodist Church in Sioux City, Iowa. And we were looking at this scripture one day, and the leader of the Bible study asked who we saw ourselves, how we saw ourselves in this story. And as we went around the group, and, you know, one said they were one person, and another said they were another person, and Susan was kind of stumped a little. She said, well, she wasn't sure who, who she was in the story, and about three or four other people across the circle kind of snickered a little bit, and they said, Susan, we wouldn't be here if you hadn't invited us. You're that servant in the story. You, you called us in to come and be a part of this fellowship and to take our faith life seriously. Now, Jim looked at the story and he says, you know, I, I had, I've lived a pretty rough life and when I look at this and I, I look at those excuses, they kind of sound like some of the things that, that I said actually the first three or four times that Susan invited me. I don't, I don't know that I ever bought any oxen or, or got land that I hadn't even seen before, but I kept coming up with reasons why I shouldn't come and be a part of this. Someone else had um, actually recently been married, and she said, you know, it would have been really sad to have gone through all the planning of a wedding and, and the reception and all of this and have people, everybody, RSVP back, no, can't make it, we have this going on or that going on. I feel a little bit like that, that uh, master of that house, that I, I think it would have been really hard. And we learned a little bit about the scripture, about all the different people and all the different elements in that story. But as I read it, getting ready for today, I, I noticed that we left somebody out. Well, I guess we left two people out. One was Jesus as the teller of the story, but I'm not surprised that none of us said, oh, I'm Jesus. Um, although... Kurt Vonnegut once said that the problem with having your books made into movies is that you lose the narrator. You lose that voice. The person I think we left out was the dinner guest. That person who had just experienced this feast, if we read earlier in chapter 14, he had just been there with all of his his friends and family around him and, and had, had had a wonderful experience while Jesus reminded people of, of maybe a new way of looking at a feast, at a dinner. Now, I've got to tell you, I'm a, I'm a dinner lover. Um, my husband has allowed that my family of origin judges the quality of a family gathering by the calorie count. He does, he does think that that is true. And part of it is we grew up in an Iowa farm family where people did physically work hard at one time. But we also grew up as good cooks, and, and part of it is we, we just really like that good food. And so, you know, I understand being in, at this meal with your family and your friends around you and being maybe a little surprised and taken back when Jesus says to invite other kinds of people when you have a big family dinner. And I wonder if that dinner guest on hearing this wasn't thinking, wow, that's, that's the kind of world I want to live in. And so he bursts out, blessed is anyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. I think he was expecting Jesus to say, you did a good job. This is, this is what I was getting at. You, you got the point. You understand it. But you know, Jesus doesn't let any of us off the hook, and he wasn't going to let that dinner guest off either. So he reminded him of how hard it would be. He reminded him 
that that meal at the kingdom of God, that there would be lots of people that would turn it down and would turn it down for silly reasons. I had a, a biblical studies professor who once taught where the intro to the Bible class was a requirement, and he ended up with a couple of Jewish young men in his class, and they heard this story and had not ever heard it before, and they burst out laughing because they immediately caught the humor that Jesus was using when he said, when the excuses were, I've bought a piece of land and I have to go see it. I just bought five yoke of oxen. That's a lot of oxen to buy without ever seeing them or trying them out. Or I've just been married, so, you know, I have other things to do. They saw the humor of, of those exaggerated excuses that people used. And so Jesus, in the words of that master, sends that slave out to the lanes and the streets to gather people in. I kind of think the lanes and the streets are kind of where we go with, you go with your trailer to see those folks that need food in the summertime and on weekends. The lanes and the streets for me were where I went when I was a home-based counselor for five years back in northeast Nebraska. And I would knock on someone's door and go in and visit with them and their families. And I would learn about them. I would learn about their struggles. And their struggles always seemed like they had so many dimensions to them. They would have a child that was acting up and being difficult, but they would also have another child that had type 1 diabetes or, or cystic fibrosis or some other major medical problem, it seemed like. There would be families that kind of, you know, you kind of needed a scorecard to keep track of who was related to who and how in this household. In fact, that's kind of how I ended up as a church and community worker. I had realized that the agency I was working for, that there were some value issues that I had with them. I wasn't ready to completely give up, but I was, I was kind of putting feelers out there for what else I might do. And at a district gathering, was visiting with one of my friends about that, and she said, Connie, go back into the pulpit. Have you ever thought about, you know, just going back into to pulpit ministry? People liked you. You were good at it. And it's like, yeah, but it never quite fit. What I really want to do, I said to Sharon, what I really want to do is figure out how to connect these wonderful church people that I know and these wonderful people that I do home-based therapy with because they need each other. And she said, they do. And I said, well, you know, the folks that I do home-based therapy with, when I, was, when I was learning how to be a counselor, one of the questions we were taught to ask was, well, who do you know that's, that's doing it the way you'd like to do it? Who do you know that's in a marriage that you wish you could, could have a marriage like that? Or who, what family do you know that looks like they're functioning, not perfect, but pretty well? Because sometimes you can build from that. And a few times that worked. But more and more, especially as, as I was assigned those folks out in the community that I went to, more and more people would scratch their head and say, we don't know anybody. And at first I said, well, sure, you know somebody that has a, you know, mom, dad, two kids, kind of normal family or and they'd go, well, you know, great-grandma and great-grandpa, they had a, a pretty good relationship. I, I remember seeing them together and watching them work things out, but grandma and grandpa, boy, they, they fought all the time, and, 
and we're divorced and together and back and forth and mom and dad, and you know, I don't even know where my dad is. Those stories over and over again. And then I thought about those folks I went to worship with on Sunday morning. All of that, not perfection, but stability. All of that strength. And I, I said, I just wish there was a way we could make that connection. And she said, Connie, that's church and community ministry. And Marshall, that district also had a church and community worker. Marshall's leaving. You should apply. And I went home, and I thought about it, and I prayed about it, and Ken and I talked about it, and we looked at it, and I uh, wrote in and got the application, which, you know, I've, I've got these master's degrees. I've got a lot of education. I've been taking a lot of classes, but, boy, that application, it was as big as any classwork I've ever done. <laughs> and I started working on it, filled it out, sent it in, applied, was interviewed, and was, was appointed to the Nebraska Rural Ministry Project and worked there for 10 years and then came to Big Stone Gap. But what I know as I read this story, as I remember that, as I think about that calling, is I have nibbled at the edges of getting my first dream to happen. And I want more. I want more connection. And I know I get irritated sometimes when a visiting pastor comes and or preacher comes to fill a pulpit and they kind of have an agenda. But folks, so I'm just going to admit it. I've got an agenda. Because I think this church could help me do that. I think there, I know there are programs, there's a networks program out that, that works very intentionally at building bridges between people. And when Jeff and I, Jeff Wright, the district superintendent, and I were talking about it, he says, yeah, it's, a lot, it's some money, but we could probably come up with the money, but I want to come up with the people, and I want you to dream with me. And to evaluate it, that may not be the best way to make those connections, but there is a way to do it to go out there and to find those people that that servant was sent to find. Maybe we all need to see ourselves as that servant and going out into the streets and lanes and the town and bringing in the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame, the struggling mother with children that have physical problems and emotional problems the struggling family that can't quite make ends meet. I invite you to explore that with me. Some of you have, have asked about, well, not exactly that, because you didn't know that was my agenda, but have asked about the possibility of doing something, of doing more. And so I invite you to come and join with me, and maybe we can figure out what it would mean to eat bread in the kingdom of God if we broke bread with some people that were maybe a little different from us, but a lot like us, and people who need the same things we need, and people who really do want to care for their families but aren't sure how. I thank you for the opportunity to, to share a little of my story with you, to share the wonderful scripture from the Gospel of Luke with you, to share in this wonderful morning of music and singing and sharing. And I pray God's blessing upon you as a church and upon us as we work together. Amen.